Hello everyone and welcome to another video in our Polishing the Classic series, the series in which we analyse classic endgames with our engines and discover amazing new plans and ideas. I'm Grandmaster Matthew Sadler and we are taking a look today at the game between Boris Spassky, ex-world champion, and Bosidar Ivanovic at the uh, Nikisic International 1983. This game demonstrates first of all some beautiful ways by the engine to uh, defend this type of ending um, some very active ideas um, implemented in ways that i'd never seen before um, it also shows spassky's great skill in making something of nothing um, my engines felt that the ending was equal pretty much all the way but you could see the practical pressure growing as uh, Spassky advanced pawns on both sides. And I think that, um, uh, that this is also a very useful skill to, uh, to examine and to master. So what we're going to do, we're just going to play through the game and uh, I'm just going to point out some, uh, some very interesting uh, things that my engines found along the way and then we'll also marvel at the same time at Spassky's skill. So this is the position after White's 34th move. And, uh, well, Spassky has some dynamic advantages in this position. His uh, extra pawn on d7 is doomed, but it'll cost black a tempo to remove it, which gives White a tempo maybe to do something. Meanwhile, <coughs> pardon me, White's attacking the e5 pawn, and White's rook is headed to um, a5 or to a6, where it attacks the a pawn and, you know, generally sort of... Uh, restricts the um, the black king either tying it to the protection of e5 or just cutting it along the sixth rank so in general white's got uh, a space advantage and a more active rook um black's got reasonable trumps too though um first of all there's this pawn on d3 that uh, the black rook will attack after rook d7 and that'll tie the white king to uh, to its protection and secondly you know if you look at um well you know, white can't just win this with his rook. How is white going to get uh, the king involved? It's not going to be easy. You know, on the king side, these pawns on e5 and f5 make a fantastic barrier, you know, that will be pretty hard for the white king to uh, to get through. So, um, you know, in principle, you sort of think, uh, you know, thinking about these things that uh, the black should be all right defending passively. And that's what Ivanovich does in the game. Um, however, you know, my engines prefer active defense. And, uh, well, we'll see uh, also how that, um, how that goes and just discuss which one is, um, is better. So um, in this position, Ivanovich played uh, king e6. Um, my engines looked at playing uh, just rook takes d7 immediately, attacking the pawn on d3. And now there's a couple of variations. Rook takes c5, rook takes d3, rook a5. You could go rook d7. Um, but um, actually my engines just wanted to play um, <coughs> f4. Um, happy to give up that a7 pawn. But the pawn on f4 now is going to force... The exchange of extra kingside pawns rook a6 check king f5 king g2 takes f takes g3 you know the only way that um um that uh white is going to win this position is to uh, uh well push the a pawn up to a6 and get the king over to support it but well with these uh, pawns so weakened i mean those pawns will be gone way before you ever get there so um, you know, this is a very powerful way for, uh, for black to defend, really. You know, give up the pawn, don't worry about defending it. Um, take the opportunity to um, weaken white's kingside structure and then just, just wait. When that pawn advances, we're going to move our rook behind it. And, uh, well, if white makes any winning attempts, then, uh, well, those pawns will go and uh, black will just move uh, his kingside pawns forward. Um, another, I mean, one interesting thing that, uh, that came up, and we're going to see this an awful lot, is that, you know, if you did play rook d7 slightly passively, you know, white plays king e2, how, was, um, uh, how were the engines playing in this position? Were they just waiting or what were they doing? Well, they were playing this move king f6 and king g5. You know, very, very active all the time. Um, and this was particularly unusual. f3, king h5, king f1, h6. So putting this uh, little house around the king and then afterwards... Now you come in and start counterattacking against the, the, the kingside pawns, and you're also going to be delivering some checks. Um, what's the point of putting the king on the fifth rank um, and this move h6? Well, um, you know, if the king's on the second rank, then um, if the rook moves to try and get counterplay, then it's check. You know, moving the king active 
onto the fifth rank, gets it out of the check. And of course, h6 was also intended to, uh, um, you know, to keep the uh, uh, to stop the h pawn from being a target once the rook gets to the seventh rank. And of course, you know, if the king's active on the fifth rank, then uh, you know any counterplay that um, that black creates, you know, against the white king side pawns will go much quicker if the king's assisting. Um, and you're going to see this all over the place. And to be honest, I, I hadn't really, uh, I hadn't really thought about it. I was, uh, you know, I saw what Ivanovic did in the game, you know, sort of passively waiting, and I thought, yeah, that seems reasonable, you know. But uh, the engines having none of it. They're just really, you know, trying to create some active play, get the king active, make sure that um, uh, the king's off the seventh rank, so that when the rook moves, it's not check anymore. Yeah, you know, just uh, just better, more active play like that. I mean, after rook takes d7, white could just play king e2. Um, black plays king e6, rook a5, similar to uh, to the game, as we'll see. But um, but the, the rook hasn't yet played uh, rook a6 check, and the king hasn't yet been forced to the back. And here my engines were, were really making advantage, uh, taking advantage of this, with this move f4. And the idea is that um, this pawn on f4 stops the king coming to e3, um, which was, it's, you know, it's kind of a square that the, the king needs if it's going to, you know, if you're going to try and start making inroads into the black uh, king side to have some sort of invasion points. Um, and um, it's actually, you know, also the only square that white's king can advance to, which, you know, still covers uh, uh, d3, at least on the king side. And, um, yeah, you know, the idea is after rook a6, uh, black's going king f5. And, uh, well, the king side pawns are going to come down, h5, g5. And, um, yeah, you know, why is black worse, actually? You know, it's just uh, doesn't seem, uh, yeah, no, no real reason for it. Um, what was I looking at? Um, well, for example, if we go g4 here, then king g5, and, uh, well, the king's just coming in here. I mean, uh, we're getting quite a bit of counterplay now. Um, rook a4, g5, g4, check, king e6. That was one of the uh, lines, king d5, and the king's, you know, just very, very active. And, uh, you know, the rook can get itself active on the second rank. I mean, uh, there's no real reason why, um, why black's any worse. Just playing, you know, very, very actively there. So this is the sort of thing that, um, you know, my engines were, uh, were going for. At the very least, king on the fifth rank um, in, um, in these sort of positions. Uh, king on the fifth rank and then um, pushing the king side pawns, you know, keeping the rook sort of attacking this pawn, ready to step off and, uh, you know, look for counterplay against, uh, on the seventh rank against White's king, even at the cost of the uh, a7 pawn. Um, so that's, you know, very, very, uh, very good. And, um, you know, well, we're going to see uh, quite a contrast, really, you know, because uh, uh, Ivanovic just took the, the passive approach and just waited during the, the, the game. And, um, you know, you can ask yourself which is better. On, on, on uh, you know, on the one hand, with the passive approach, you're, um, uh, you know, you're not ruining your position, so you're just staying with it and, uh, um, you know, letting your opponent try and find a way in. But, you know, I think... Uh, um, if you look at what Spassky actually manages, um, and then you imagine, you know, facing that in a practical game, that uh, psychological situation of just waiting for stuff to happen and seeing that the opponent is improving his position is actually uh, not so easy to, uh, to deal with. When you're playing actively like this, um, you know, moving your king forward, moving your pawns forward, um, you know, really, really doing something, that's often an, an easier psychological um, uh, situation to be in. You know, and uh, yeah, you know, I certainly think it's um, it's worth it. But um, but yeah, I mean, uh, as I said, you know, these ideas of just moving king f6 to g5 hadn't really occurred to me, actually. So, uh, yeah, you know, you also know how how can you uh, become active as well? You also need to know that. And well, yeah, that's what we're learning from uh, from all the engine uh, games I've been playing from these positions. So after king e6, Spassky played a very clever move, rook c6 check. Um, the idea is that um, king takes d7, rook a6 is a bit awkward. Uh, black's got to be just a, a little bit more ingenious than, than he should be, you know, to, uh, to keep things together. So black played king e7, king e2, rook takes d7, rook a6. And uh, um, by, you know, not taking the pawn with a king, you've been able to take it with a rook and defend the pawn on a7. But, you know, white's sort of, sort of got the, the optimal amount from his dynamic possibilities on move 34 because um well rooks are attacking the pawn rooks defending it and the king's been pushed back so you know we saw uh, this counterplay with the king on e6 f4 that's now you know basically out of it because uh, uh, the rook is uh, cutting across here and well it's going to stay on there for uh, for the foreseeable future now um 
Yeah, I mean, my engines, my engines is uh, still a trivial draw as black. I mean, uh, basically 38 draws out of 38 for my, uh, for my engines from, uh, you know, this and similar positions. Um, and in fact, black defends, you know, well in this game for uh, a long period of time. But you do sort of feel the pressure growing. And, uh, well, when black blunders at the end, you sort of feel, yeah, you know, probably uh, that was just the build-up of pressure that Spassky managed. So king f7 played, king e3. King comes in. I mean, you've got all sorts of uh, ideas here for um, for white without any of them being amazingly, you know, decisive or clear. Um, you've got f4, you've got g4, you've got maybe h4 as well. You know, um, not clear which one is gonna is going to uh, to work. So you know, for now, it's probably a good idea just to um, uh, to keep your options and uh, and just put the onus on black. Rook e7 was played. Um, and I thought this was a, a little bit odd because, um, after all, you're no longer attacking the d-pawn, which feels, you know, like uh, like uh, is something you should do. Uh, you know, just uh, king e7 seemed like a, a much more uh, natural waiting move to me. And, you know, from in terms of uh, being passive, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think king e7 is a, is a perfectly good move. Um, it's possible that rook e7 had another idea. Because <laughs> it's quite interesting. I mean, my engines were saying king g7 in this position. Um, which I'd rejected just due to rook e6 attacking the e5 pawn, which is rather embarrassing. Um, but actually, you know, the engines were completely happy with this. Rook d5, rook e7, king f6. Um, so rook h7, we've got rook a5 again, <clears throat> which is very nice. Defending the pawn on a7, attacking the pawn on a2. So rook a7. And now f4 check. I mean, this, this is one of those, you know, uh, engine uh, activity lines, which, um, yeah... I don't know, a little bit nervous about it, really, because, um, you know, I, I, it, it wasn't really at all obvious to me that this was a good way to play. But the engines uh, absolutely love it here. Play over, go to rook h5, hitting this pawn. a4, rook takes h3. I was a little bit nervous, you know, the rook's over on this side and, uh, well, this a pawn's marching. But, um, but actually, this is pretty good. And the fact that you've developed um, uh, a protected past h pawn is also quite useful. For example, uh, this is how a, a number of games went. King f4, h4, rook a8, rook g2. Slightly annoying, cutting off the king there. King g7, g5 check, rook a2. Yeah, and what are you going to do here? You can't do uh, very much at all. Uh, the rook can't move over. And, uh, well, I mean, this uh, h pawn uh, has also got a, a little feeling that it might want to run as well. So, you know, king g4, rook a4 check, rook a3, and, uh, and the game was drawn there. So, you know, that's um, um, possible. Um, you know, what is the idea of king g7? Well, of course, you know, if you didn't play rook e6, then black just wants to play king h6 and uh, get the king active. You know, if you then go something like rook e6, I go rook d5, threatening to come over to a5, and, well, you don't have a rook e7 check, right? You know, that's the big idea of putting the king on h6. And if you go rook e5, for example, rook e7 there, I come in with g5, and, you know... Yeah, I can do all sorts of things. I can, uh, you know, maybe move the h pawn. I can also just bring the king back to f6. I'm, I'm uh, you know, a bit more active on the sixth rank. Somehow the the white rook, rook has moved off the uh, the sixth rank, so we've got that activity. You know, it's all um, uh, already possible, but um, you know, just a, a very uh, powerful idea. But feels a little bit risky to allow rook e6. You know, although the engines think it's fine, so. Rook e7, maybe, from Ivanovich, was actually an idea to, OK, I'll stop rook e6, and then I'm just going to bring my king out here and get some activity. Quite possible. Um, and it's also quite possible that, um, that uh, Boris Basky played extremely subtly here and decided to stop it with, uh, with g4 and eventually g5. Um, now, this was not a move that my engines were, uh, were playing, um, but, yeah, you know, they sort of consider everything to be drawn, really, in this position. So, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, it's, uh, if, you, if you know that already, then it's, it's sort of a potluck, really, what you end up playing in some ways. I mean, I, um, I, I tried a few engine games, and here we see, you know, this plan King H6 uh, taking place, um, and uh, Rook D6, King H5. You know, really, uh, again, really nice uh, activity. King F3, King G5... King g2, e4, 
takes, takes, rook c7, rook d5, king f6, nothing much uh, happening there. Um, another idea was if white goes h4, I go king h5, f3, and then just g5, you know, and just uh, start exchanging off these pawns and just give myself lots of freedom. You know, rook d6, f4 check, takes, takes, rook g7. I mean, I've now got a past h pawn to uh, uh, to play with, and, you know, why on earth should black be worse here? You know, you just don't, uh, you just don't see it really. So um, yeah, I mean, uh, again, you know, this uh, this plan of uh, activating the king was uh, king h6, etc., was quite a threat. So it could well be that uh, that Spassky uh, decided to anticipate this, played g4, um, and then after king g7, played g5, which you know clamps down on on the black king side, gives an extra outpost on f6, gives you the chance of um, restricting this black king to the back rank. Um, now, in actual fact, my engines didn't want to allow this, and what they wanted was this good move, f takes g4, h takes g4, and then there's a few ideas, but h6 was um, was the, the main engine reaction. And uh, just running king g7, well, we're stopping g5, just running king g7, and then either the rook can come to f7 and uh, find an extra way of attacking some kingside pawns, or once we play king g7, stopping rook h6, we can just think of uh, of pushing our h pawn down. And, uh, for example, uh, king e4, king g7, a4, h5, g5, rook f7, hitting the f2 pawn, and the h pawn's a runner. You know, it's, uh, yeah, pretty cool, really. You know, pretty uh, nice idea, this. Uh, um, and, um, yeah, I mean, you know, again, you know, it's it's just the, the engines finding uh, unexpected chances to activate the pieces. And it's, you know, in, in a way, it's, it's not so... Uh, it's not so, you know, difficult in a way. It's, you know, it's actually just opening um, uh, files with FG and creating a potential outside pass pawn. But somehow, of course, you know, when you're defending, you get into a, a sort of a of a rut. Say, okay, I'm just going to stay still, do nothing, and um, yeah, and you maybe miss those opportunities. But you know, I think uh, it's a very fine idea from uh, from Spassky to uh, to do this, really restricting the uh, blacks' activity and blacks, you know, let him now. So, um, so white's you know encroaching a little bit, but this is still a drawn position in principle. Um, the one thing you mustn't, oops, sorry, the one thing you mustn't do for um, uh, for black in this position is to play the move um, h6, because after h4, you know, if white can do this, if white can set up this um, this uh, uh, clamp on the king side, then well, the activity of this rook increases enormously because it's actually got a you know. A free target now on here and of course the activity of the black king decreases enormously because it's tied down to the g6 pawn and um yeah i mean i had a number of uh, of um uh, uh games here um for example rook b7 a4 king h7 a5 rook e7 f3 just gradually coming in i mean we've got lots of ideas here d4 opening up is uh, is possible um and here actually black just uh decided to go for counterplay. Uh, this was uh, Crystal against Komodo. But um, you can see the difference with having uh, the pawn on g5 here. You know, the king isn't escaping away and uh, helping the king side pawns. It's moving back miserably. And, uh, you know, this is very unpleasant. Um, so we put the pawn to a7, uh, and the king has to go to g7. Um, otherwise, we get this typical trick. Rook h8, rook takes a7, rook h7 check. Um, but now, actually, you've got a pass D pawn, so you just go D4 and queen this pawn to glory. So, um, um, yeah, you know, I mean, um, a move like H6 is, is very, very dangerous. So, you know, Black's completely right just to uh, just to wait there. Um, A4 now, and this is what Spassky now does really well. I mean, Spassky's already, um, you know, I think in a practical game, if, you know, you were facing uh, a player like... Uh, the ex world champion um you know you'd already be a little bit nervous right because uh, you know here you are waiting and he's already encroached on the king's side and now he's encroaching on the queen's side and um maybe you know your um your objective um uh, sensible self says come on nothing happening here but uh, but yeah you've still got to wait for it and you still have the idea that white is improving uh, his position for free 
I mean, here, you know, we're advancing the pawn to a5. It's closer to queening. So if we take the a pawn, uh, yeah, I mean, the a pawn obviously is much more dangerous on a5 than it was on a2. We might even be able to advance it to a6 and then create a, an outpost on b7 for the rook. You know, that's possible too. But, uh, you know, it's um, just a, a few possibilities. I mean, it's not uh, clear. It's just, uh, but, you know, suddenly some endings with a pawn on a5 rather than a2, they'll become more dangerous for black than, uh, than before. So black waits, rook d7, a5, king e7. Black's got to be a little bit careful here. Rook e7, d4. Um, throwing in an f4 check. Takes, takes. Yeah, I mean, the king's a little bit close to the queen side. We've got all sorts of threats. You know, my engines were still drawing this, but um, um, it starts feeling like uh, I've got to start being quite accurate here, which um, is not a nice feeling to have, really. Um, there's one quite nice way that um, uh, that uh, Crystal drew here. So rook e3, rook takes f3, rook a3, and then gives this um, this little check here. King f4, rook e6. And then uh, the rook sacks the pawn on a6 and also cuts the king off from uh, from coming over. And this is, uh, yeah, just a, a typical draw. So, um, um, yeah, you know, after a5... Black play king e7, keeping the rook on uh, d7, preventing d4, and now white's got to work out a plan here. And what Spassky decided to go for was to go h5. Now, uh, oops, sorry, g takes h5 and then uh, rook h6 afterwards. Little preview, sneak preview there. Now, what is the effect of this? I mean, first of all, you are actually going to loosen up this black um, structure, and that means that pawns are going to be loose. So there's going to be a lot of slaying of pawns uh, in the next uh, few moves. But I think, you know, one thing you've really got to understand when that happens, you know, when pawns start being removed from the board, is that that also creates new entry paths for the white king. So um, it's not just about taking pawns and maybe uh, getting one more than the opponent. It's also about, you could see, you know, quite a profound change in the position that a king that was completely blocked out before suddenly can become extremely active. So that's definitely something you've got to watch out for. You know, and uh, it's one of those things, you know, that um, um, some positional factors that you took for granted at the start of an end, end game, you know, just with, uh, with small changes, with uh, incremental improvements from one side, you know, they can suddenly change completely, become either, you know, very important all of a sudden. And, uh, well, keeping a track of that is, the, you know, part of the secret to, uh, to good end game player, but very hard to do uh, in a practical game. <coughs> Now, I mean, we said that um, that we shouldn't allow, you know, white to have a target on the uh, on the sixth rank. So king f7 is really bad. Um, actually, there's a few ways to do it. I mean, we can go check rook f6 and rook e6 takes rook e6 again, which is a horrific ending for uh, for black. And there's also this idea just to very alpha zero ish, really, you know, just uh, put a pawn on h6, make this pawn on h7 very weak and then, uh, yeah, just win it. Basically, why not? So, um, uh, and this is also, you know, very, very dangerous for um, for black. So G takes H5 is correct. I mean, sometimes the wrecking action is the best. You know, a pawn uh, gets, uh, puts pressure on your position, get rid of it, um, wreck it, create chaos. White's got plenty of, uh, you know, of loose pawns as well. So, um, you know, whilst white's taking stuff, black should be able to take stuff as well. And, um, you know, actually in the coming um, uh, pawn uh, slaying uh, fest, there are plenty of ways for black to, uh, to draw. And probably Ivanovich doesn't choose the very best. But what he does is, you know, is quite reasonable. You know, it's um, um, so king f8, rook h5, and now rook d5. And, well, you see one of the drawbacks of moving a pawn up, it becomes easier to attack here. So rook d5 counterattacking against the pawn. Rook h7 takes g6. <coughs> and now rook a6, just uh, attacking that pawn. <clears throat> rook f7 check, and here, uh, here Ivanovich um, makes um, a big blunder, in actual fact. Um, and, yeah, I'm not quite sure why it was, why it happened, because it's, it's quite a surprising one. Um, but, I mean, it's maybe, you know, nervousness brought on by, by all Spassky's harrying. You know, he's um, gradually encroached, gradually added space to his position. It makes you nervous, and, of course, you don't have the... The comfort of knowing that the engine thinks that uh, the position is drawn. Um, it could well be that, um, you know, I mean, essentially, Ivanovich plays king e8 and decides to take this pawn with a rook, but it is much more natural to play king g8 
and then try and take the pawn with the king, you know, and keep the rook uh, over here. But maybe, yeah, you know, black played rook a6. Maybe he thought, you know, uh, the, the natural train of thought was to carry on taking it with the rook. And maybe also he thought the rook didn't look so great on a6. But actually it's performing a very important task there. And um, yeah, you know, so uh, I mean, king g8 was the best here. Rook takes f5, king g7, rook e5, king g6, d4, king f6, f4. And now rook a1. And this is, uh, you're going to compare this in the game, but what you've got here, you've got this rook is absolutely superb in actual fact. It's um, preparing the advance of the a pawn, so to distract the white pieces. And at the same time, the rook can actually um, give checks on d1, e1, f1. Um, well, either checks or attacks against this, uh, these pawns, you know, whilst um, white is, you know, trying to advance them. And um, yeah, that combination of two things, the distracting A-pawn and those checks along the back rank, um, that enables white to, um, to hold the ending. Um, for example, let's have a look at a little example. My engines didn't really manage to do um, very much here. For example, uh, king e4, we go a5. Uh, d5, we go rook a4 check, rook a1, a4, a3, check, rook c4, hitting the pawn on uh, f4 f5 rook a4 and well you can imagine that this is uh, pretty okay for black with uh, rook threatening a2 this rook has to go passive we can take this pawn and we can uh, then check the um, the white king um yeah i mean it's just a uh, you know combination activity in uh, in defense with um, um with rook checks from the back um and also some distraction of white with the uh, past a pawn um, still, you know, easy to go to go wrong, right? I mean, uh, one thing I was looking at after king e4, I thought, well, could we maybe just uh, check like this? I mean, uh, maybe even get an immediate draw, right? You know, because we're attacking the f-pawn. But apparently king d6 takes and d5 is just a win for, um, uh, for white. And, uh, you know, the reason for that is that actually, um, yeah, the king's sort of on the wrong side of the board here. If it, it should be over here, really, and then you could check disruptively from the side, from the h-file, nice and far away. But um, yeah, I mean, with the um, uh, with the king on this side, well, we can check on um, on 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 the B file. A file's a little bit tricky. We need to get the A pawn out of the way. And uh, well, meanwhile, meanwhile, the white rook's just uh, moving. The pawn's moving through. You know, it goes very very fast. So very easy to um, even to get this wrong. You know, but um, but again, if you just think of the principles, let's just distract white with that A pawn. And um, and then annoy white with uh, with checks afterwards. Then you, you you know you should be able to draw this. It's uh, yeah. I mean the problem uh, the, the the reason you know these checks are so annoying is that well you know there's two pawns separate separated by a file and the king really needs to be in between them to uh, help them advance. If you can check just check the king away from that uh, um, from that uh, roll in between the two pawns, then you're always going to get counter chances. But king e8 was played by black. Rook f5, rook g6, rook e5 check uh, played, um, king d7, um, and now a really important move here. And the reason why, um, uh, why, yeah, black's plan here is is bad. Um, I think you know maybe also you know looking at this position just now actually uh, you know maybe black's idea was uh, well you know I want to uh, support the advance of my a pawn so I want my king to be close. I mean that's also uh, you know possible reasoning. But um, yeah, it's kind of the um, um, yeah, it's just not the right plan. Um, and after this move, a6, you can actually see something slightly painful here, uh, which is that the rook is tied down to the pawn. And uh, well, these pawns are going to advance and you want to be behind. You really want to be behind to, to, to start harrying the king. You can't really chase the king away effectively from the, uh, from the front. And, um, and white's pawns are coming very quickly, even with tempo on top of that. Rook d6, king e4. And you finally, you know, get to move the, uh, uh, the rook away. But already, you know, we're threatening rook e6. You know, this pawn is, uh, is very, very fast. And, you know, the a pawn still hasn't moved. And, well, in actual fact, after a5, black forgot about rook e6. King c5 takes, takes. And here black resigned. Because these pawns two uh, files apart are fantastic at protecting each other. And this pawn is going to move on. I mean, I've, I can stop him in time. And well, you know, it's the standard story. You can't take this one because then f6 moves. And if you come uh, all the way around here uh, to try and attack the pawn, I just make sure that uh, my pawn moves here and I'm ready to play d5, 
to d6 afterwards. So, um, uh, yeah, you know, a very nice uh, victory there. Um, and I thought that um, there were just a lot of um, practical points to learn. I mean, it's interesting to look at, an, at, a, at a rook end game that's actually, you know, objectively drawn and then see, well, how could it go wrong? Um, I did think that, um, you know, what was very impressive to me was um, this activity that, um, that um, my engines were aiming for. So this set up, you know, work out how to keep your rook on, your king on the sixth, and then, um, yeah, keep on gaining space with your kingside pawns. And, um, and also be willing to just give up a pawn uh, for counterplay, have an active rook, and, um, yeah, you know, try and uh, wreck the white kingside to, um, to make it as, uh, as loose as possible. Because, uh, yeah, you know, in these positions with an outside pawn, it, you know, you can't force it through just with the rook. You need the king coming over. But then the more vulnerable the kingside pawns, the, the quicker black's counterplay is going to be. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, yeah, again, you know, I also liked, you know, this plan here as well. You know, just the, the king coming in off the uh, seventh rank. Don't just wait, you know, for stuff to happen. You've got activity that you can do. King on the uh, on the fifth rank here and... Um, uh, and um, yeah, you know, helping to advance the kingside pawns and yeah, weaken and exchange uh, um, uh, pawns on, on on the kingside there. Um, now I thought uh, uh, that uh, Spassky played it very very nicely. You know, um, I thought um, uh, again uh, this in this position, this move king g7, just giving up a pawn again, very typical, just to get the king active. You know, I thought that was great, but I thought Spassky played it brilliantly. I think this move g4 followed by g5. Um, was was excellent, you know. Really showed great understanding, and um, again, I like the uh, the engine idea of F G four and H six very much, you know. And just uh, spotting just uh, um, two sources of counterplay arising from that one uh, structural uh, uh, change: a rook coming to the F file, attacking these pawns, and a, uh, a, a past H pawn, you know, distracting the white rook. So um, uh, again, very nice play. Um, but yeah, you know, what Spassky did here was great. I mean, an A4 to A5, space, putting pressure on the opponent, making him feel, you know, suddenly Black's got to check, oh, you know, uh, I thought those endings were drawn uh, with uh, exchanges in the centre. Is that still true with the pawn on A5? You know, um, so again, just putting psychological pressure on and then, you know, this last minute. It's always something, I think, during practical games, you know, you have to, at some stage, take a decision and you sort of think, oh, I'd love to keep the tension for longer, you know, keep uh, my opponent nervous. I can see he's getting nervous. In a way, striking... Uh, against his position, um, you know, release attention because then you're sort of forcing uh, the opponent to to find good moves very often. But uh, but yeah, you know, uh, it's uh, fortune favors the brave, and here, you know, um, just at, towards the end of the ending, Black just got his plan kind of wrong, really. You know, sort of thought uh, he wanted to uh, support the a pawn with the king, um, but in actual fact, the um, the key thing was to have the king um, in front of the uh, uh, of the pawns, you know, able to uh, to harry these and to have the um, uh, the rook as active as possible, supporting the advance of the a pawn from the front and also ready to check from the back. Um, again, a very important uh, um, thing to um, uh, to understand. I mean, uh, you know, again, uh, often you, you can't really judge. I mean, this is a very unusual ending, actually. This uh, rook D and F against A. I've never actually seen it, but um, but you know you, you can't easily judge it. But um, but again, you know if you if you've got the choice between having uh, you know your rook super active and your rook a bit passive on the third rank, then yeah, you know I I just guess that you've got to uh, you've got to go for the activity, assume the activity's right, and then you know see what uh, life holds for you in that position. Um, but I think you know it's very striking that uh, the engines time after time after time are finding ways for, of uh, activating the king, activating the rook, even at the cost of a pawn. That's just, uh, you know, almost automatic for, uh, for engines. Yeah, wouldn't believe now, uh, would you, that, uh, you know, that uh, all those years ago when, uh, when computers, uh, chess computers started, that they were seen as completely materialistic. It just, uh, you know, just totally different nowadays. So there we are. Hope you enjoyed that uh, that ending. I felt I learned uh, a, a lot from it. Just uh, playing in games practically, both from the defensive side and the attacking side. If you like the video, why not give me a like or subscribe to the channel to be kept up to date with all the videos that appear. Got a uh, few more from uh, from Spassky coming. Some uh, some very nice ones coming. And um, otherwise, why not read my book, The uh, Silicon Road to Chess Improvement, which. Uh, 
uh, now available on Amazon amazingly and uh, full and full of uh, great engine games and plenty of yeah, very unusual tips I think for uh, how to work with engines and how to train with them. So there we are but uh, anyway thanks very much for watching and hopefully see you at the next video.